There's only four that I know personally in Queens that wasn't scared of Prem. 50, E Money Bags, mm -hmm. Hamo, and Big Noise Troy. They had the kind of reputation where a lot of were scared. Grown men older than me, but like I said, there's four. Remember them four names mm -hmm. Boo Boo, 50 Cent, E Money Bags, Troy, Big Nose Troy, and Hamo. Did you ever find out who did it? Yeah, I, I know who did it shortly after. Yeah. Yeah. And they are now where? Oh, the guy who actually shot me is dead. You know, it's like America has this ongoing obsession with the Italian mafia. They romanticize the whole self-made, against the odds thing, and even though it's all about power and violence, it's somehow seen as kind of glamorous. I mean, look at how iconic the Godfather trilogy and the Sopranos are in our pop culture. And let's not forget about Frank Sinatra, whose ties to the mob gave him this edgy allure way before street cred was a thing in hip-hop. But here's the thing. When it comes to black figures with street power, it's like the narrative shifts entirely. Take John Gotti, for example. He's labeled a crime boss. But if you're black and in a similar position, suddenly you're just a thug like Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. And while the Gambinos are called a family, the Supreme Team gets labeled as black guys destroying their own community. Yet, in Queens, where the Supreme Team held sway, it was a different story. Sure, they were feared, but they were also idolized, especially by kids growing up in poverty. These drug dealers were like the only symbols of success within reach, you know. But then there were these two guys, 50 Cent and E Money Bags, who didn't buy into the fear everyone else had. 50 almost paid the price for it, and E Money Bags, well, he paid the ultimate price for not fearing them. It's wild how these two individuals single-handedly terrorized a whole generation of rappers. Let's dig deeper into their stories. There's only four that I know personally in Queens that wasn't scared of cream. 50, E Money Bags, mm -hmm. Hamo, and Big Nose Troy. So back in the 80s, in the heart of New York City, there was this crew called the Supreme Team based out of South Jamaica, Queens. At the helm were two guys you didn't want to mess with, Kenneth Supreme McGriff and his nephew, Gerald Prince Miller. They were like the dynamic duo of the streets, Supreme, the brains behind the operation, and Prince, the muscle who made sure things ran smoothly on the ground. These guys were no joke. They had their fingers in all sorts of pies, pulling in over 200K a day at their peak. And while they were building their empire, something else was brewing in the city hip-hop. Back then, the scene was different. Rappers, athletes, entertainers, and street figures all mingled together. But the real power players? They were the hustlers and gangsters, setting the trends in fashion and holding down the community when times were tough. McGriff and Miller's reign in Queens didn't go unnoticed. They were like legends in the hood, respected and feared in equal measure. And their influence didn't stop at street corners it reached right into the budding hip-hop scene. Artists like LL Cool J and Nas drew inspiration from their hustle, turning their stories into lyrics that resonated with a whole generation. Hip-hop's got this undeniable connection to the streets, right? And one of the biggest beefs from back in the 2000s between 50 Cent and Inc., well, turns out it was deeper than just rap. It was like 50 versus the Supreme Team, the crew led by Kenneth McGriff, the trouble began when 50 Cent released Gato Quran, a track that laid out the detailed history of the Supreme Team and its leader, Kenneth McGriff's activities. The song didn't sit well with McGriff, leading to a serious backlash. The lyrics read, Yo, when you hear talk of the South Side, you hear talk of the team, CN feared Prince and respected Premi. For all you slow mother F, I'm a break it down iller. See, Premi was the businessman and Prince was the it's widely believed that McGriff retaliated by sending Daryl Homo Baum, a known figure in the drug scene, to take down 50 Cent. Baum wasn't just any street guy, he was closely linked to Mike Tyson, being his best friend and a key member of Tyson's security team after they met in prison in the 1990s. 
Tyson had promised to help Baum get on his feet after their stint behind bars, and he kept his word. Baum's life, however, took a tragic turn. He was shot in the head on a desolate street while heading home one night, and died from his injuries. But before his own violent end, Baum made a notorious mark by allegedly being the one who attempted to 50 Cent in 2000. The scene was dramatic. As 50 was about to leave his grandmother's house and join his friends in a parked car, Baum supposedly ambushed him, firing multiple rounds with a 9mm handgun. 50 Cent was struck in various parts of his body. Hands, legs, face, hips, arms, and chest. He spent nearly two weeks in a hospital and took five months to fully recover from his injuries. In a twist of fate, Baum himself was just a few weeks after the shooting, a point 50 Cent himself noted in an interview, reflecting on the eerie timing of his assailant's death. Did you ever find out who did it? Yeah, I, I knew who did it shortly after. Yeah. yeah. And they are now where? Oh, the guy who actually shot me. Comes around, I'm gonna shot me. Three weeks later, he got shot down. While 50 Cent miraculously survived an assassination attempt, E-Money Bags wasn't as fortunate and ultimately met a violent end. His death in 2001 was reportedly in response to an earlier incident where he had allegedly shot and fatally wounded Black Just, a member of the Supreme team. The rumor was that E-Money Bags had actually been aiming for Supreme himself, but missed, hitting Black Just in the thigh instead, which led to his death from blood loss. A few years after this incident, it's believed that Supreme orchestrated a brutal retaliation against E Moneybags. In a scene reminiscent of guerrilla warfare, it's said that some associates of Supreme ambushed E Moneybags while he was sitting in his parked car, riddling it with bullets. He was hit ten times and died there. Parallel to these street wars, another tragic event unfolded which had far reaching implications. Officer Edward Barn, a young NYPD officer stationed in the 103rd Precinct in Jamaica, Queens, was murdered while on duty. He was guarding the home of a local immigrant who had been repeatedly targeted by criminals for contacting the police about illegal activities in the area. The home had previously been firebombed and its owner had received multiple threats. Despite the risks and recent violent acts in South Queens, Byrne was assigned to watch over the house alone. Burns wasn't just a local tragedy. It sparked a national outcry and became a pivotal point in American politics. President Ronald Reagan seized on the murder as a rallying call to push through the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, significantly escalating the war on drugs. His successor, George H.W. Bush, continued this tough-on-crime agenda, often invoking Burns' memory on the campaign trail and even carrying Burns' police badge as a symbol. Bush also endorsed the 1033-1208 program, which provided local and state police forces with military-grade equipment. The hardline policies initiated by Reagan and Bush were later intensified under President Bill Clinton with the 1994 Crime Bill, which introduced severe punitive measures like the three strikes rule and disparate sentencing guidelines for crack versus powdered coke. These policies not only perpetuated the war on drugs, but also had a profound impact on the dynamics of the drug trade and the communities most affected by it. The cumulative effect of these policies was a dramatic escalation in incarceration rates, particularly affecting black communities across the United States. Now, let's shift gears to the leader of the Supremists. So, Kenneth Supreme, McGriff, once at the helm of a notorious criminal empire, found himself at a crossroads after serving a lengthy prison sentence. Although he had amassed significant wealth and influence through illegal activities, these came at a high price, including a decade behind bars. Upon his release, McGriff had the opportunity to leave his criminal past behind and embark on a legitimate path, thanks to an offer from a major figure in the hip-hop industry. However, McGriff's decision to decline this lifeline remains a topic of intrigue and speculation, as explored in Showtime's new three-part documentary, Supreme Team. 
Back in 1987, McGriff had been incarcerated for narcotics possession, which shifted the leadership dynamics within his organization. His co-leader, Miller, took the reins in his absence. While McGriff was known for his negotiation skills, Miller was more reliant on force to maintain control. Under Miller's leadership, the operation reportedly generated around $500,000 per week, but the increase in violence was notable and numerous homicides were linked to their activities, though none could be directly tied back to Miller. Eventually, in March 1990, Miller was arrested and later sentenced in 1993 to six consecutive life terms for drug. McGriff was released in 1994 into a world that had changed dramatically from the one he left. The crackdown on drugs following the high-profile 1988 of Officer Edward Byrne had significantly altered police strategies and tactics. Additionally, the landscape of hip-hop, which had also undergone considerable transformation, presented new opportunities and challenges. Despite these changes and the chance to reinvent himself within the music industry, McGriff chose not to pursue the legitimate offer presented to him, a decision that continues to provoke questions about his motivations and the possibilities of what might have been had he chosen a different path. When Kenneth Supreme McGriff was first incarcerated, hip-hop music was still emerging, playing a secondary role to the raw, unvarnished street life that often inspired it. Yet, even as hip-hop continued to draw inspiration from street hustlers and gangsters, sometimes at its own peril, it was on the cusp of becoming a major commercial force. By the time McGriff was released from prison, rappers had ascended to superstar status, with hip-hop culture deeply entrenched in mainstream media. The notorious deeds of the Supreme Team had even been celebrated in the verses of prominent artists like Nas and Ghostface embedding the group's legacy within the fabric of rap music. One notable example occurred in the summer of 1997, when the notorious B.I.G. released Mo Money Mo Problems, which quickly climbed to the top of the charts. In this track, the late Brooklyn rap icon paid tribute to the Queens-based Supreme Team with lines like, My Team Supreme, Stay Clean Triple Beam, Lyrical Dream, I Be That highlighting the profound influence of these street legends on his lyrics. Upon his release, McGriff found an ally in Irv Lorenzo, a rap producer from Queens better known by his stage name, Irv Gotti. Gotti was rapidly rising in the music industry and would soon establish himself as one of the most influential figures in late 1990s and early 2000s hip-hop. His record label, Inc., drew its name from the infamous group of hitmen organized by mobster Charlie Lucky Luciano, mirroring the interplay between street lore and commercial success. Under Gotti's leadership, Inc. propelled artists like Ja Rule and Ashanti to the pinnacle of the Billboard charts, further illustrating the shifting dynamics from the streets to the studio, where McGriff found new opportunities but also new challenges in navigating his post-prison life. Irv Gotti introduced McGriff to one of his key associates, Jay-Z, marking a pivotal moment in McGriff's post-prison life. Suddenly, McGriff found himself in the company of some of the biggest names in the music industry. With Jay-Z and Gotti by his side, he experienced a whirlwind of tours across different cities, surrounded by the trappings of a successful legal lifestyle, money, influence, and adulation, all obtained without breaking the law. Jay's who himself had a past involved with drug along Interstat 95 before turning to music as a career, viewed McGriff as a seasoned veteran from the streets whose life he hoped to help transform. Together with Gotti, Jay-Z actively encouraged McGriff to embrace a legitimate livelihood. They supported his ventures, such as the 2003 film Crime Partners, which was based on Donald Goines's novel Black Gangster. This was part of their broader effort to introduce McGriff to legitimate business opportunities, putting him in environments where legal deals worth millions were negotiated. In what became a defining moment highlighted in the documentary, Irv Gotti once offered McGriff a significant position as vice president at Inc., 
a role that would be highly desirable to anyone aspiring to succeed in the music industry, particularly someone with McGriff's criminal background. However, McGriff declined the offer. The reason wasn't a lack of appeal or mistrust towards Irv Gotti, nor was it about financial security. McGriff rejected the position because he had spent most of his life leading autonomously, answering to no one. Assuming a role where he would now have to report to others felt like a step down, a compromise of his independence and authority. This decision was influenced heavily by his pride and ego, illustrating the complex interplay of his past identity and potential future paths. Kenneth had the potential to transition into a powerful figure in the music industry, but his deep-rooted ties to the street life held a stronger appeal. To some, his decision to cling to his street reputation over a lucrative career in music might seem irrational, but for McGriff, the respect and identity he garnered from street life were indispensable. Despite the risks and the numerous enemies he made, the respect he received in that world outweighed other considerations. McGriff's involvement in the streets included serious accusations, such as the notorious attack on 50 Cent, where the rapper was shot nine times. McGriff himself acknowledged his connection to this event in the 2007 documentary. By then, any chance he had to pursue legitimate business ventures effectively vanished. Ultimately, McGriff was sentenced to life imprisonment on multiple charges, including the alleged orchestration of the 2001 of rapper Eric E. Moneybags Smith. Meanwhile, Irv Gotti and his brother Chris Lorenzo were acquitted of money laundering charges in 2005, charges that were tied to their associations with McGriff. Despite McGriff's incarceration, his legacy and the narrative of the Supreme Team continue to resonate within the rap community. References to McGriff and the Supreme Team are still prevalent in hip-hop lyrics, underscoring their enduring influence. For instance, Joey Beta and DJ Premier's track Letting Off Steam and Young Jeezy's 2008 Put On Remix, where Jay-Z reminisces about trying to steer Supreme away from street life. Jay-Z reflects on his efforts, rapping, I put Premi in my truck, told him leave them streets alone expressing his foresight about McGriff's inevitable incarceration and his failed attempts to guide him towards a different path. More recently, in Drake's Talk Up, Jay-Z compares himself to other street legends who failed to escape their past, highlighting the fates of figures like Big Meech and Supreme McGriff and the consequences of their choices. Kenneth, who is set to turn 64 in September, is expected to spend the remainder of his life behind bars, a consequence of the choices he made. McGriff always viewed hip-hop as a younger sibling that he cherished and respected, one that ran parallel to his own reign in Queens at the height of his influence. However, he never fully understood how the dynamics of his relationship with the music industry had shifted during his brief periods of freedom. In the world of hip-hop, there are those who merely portray gangsters in their lyrics, and then there are the actual gangsters. Changing one's inherent nature is often an insurmountable challenge. In the documentary, McGriff reflects on his intentions in the criminal world, stating, the whole objective for me being in the game was to exit the game. Yet, he acknowledges that something invariably pulls you back. More often than not, that something is one's own self-reflection, a reminder of who they truly are deep down. That's it for today. Until next time, bye.